Good morning and welcome. It's so good to see all of you. I invite you to stand with us as we begin to worship this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand.
continue our worship together.
Lord, we're so grateful to be here and worship together this morning. We ask that uh, you just guide our hearts and that we meet you wherever we're at today. We love you so much, and it's your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. We invite you to take this time to greet somebody next to you. you guys this morning yeah it's a good morning we had a great women's tea yesterday if you were there you know we had a lovely time we thank our team for that and we just want to welcome you to sunrise i'm kim shy and the kids pastor here and we are glad that you're with us if you are with us for the first time we invite you to stop at the desk out in the lobby and you can pick up a mug there that has some information in it for you all about sunrise and ways that you can be involved and and just things that are going on here we have just a couple announcements for you this morning and the first one one, you see the choir behind me, our fantastic choir. The spring concert is coming up, and it will be on May 18th at 2 p.m., and it's completely free, so bring your friends, your neighbors, your family, and come out and enjoy a great afternoon of music with our choir. The next thing we have coming up is baptisms. On May 19th, we're going to be having baptisms in this service. If you're interested in getting baptized, we invite you to go to sunrise.church slash baptism, and there you can sign up and someone will contact you with the next steps. At this time, I'd like to invite Cliff out, our executive pastor, and he has some special guests with him this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kim. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Y'all look good. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, it is a really fun privilege that I have uh, this morning is that I get to introduce to you Joshua and Ann Benavides. And uh, the reason this is a, a neat opportunity for us here at Sunrise is Joshua is the executive director of Extreme Response Asia. And uh, if you know those words, extreme response, you know that Jason Chappelle, uh, who, is, who is our, is it okay to say homeboy? Um, that's, I don't know where I got that, I'm sorry. Uh, but he, uh, he's from here, and, uh, and he is one of our own that we sent out there. Uh, but not only Jason uh, being a part of Extreme Response, but I believe it's been something like 17 years, 14 years, that Sunrise has been sending teams over uh, to the Philippines to be a part of that. And so today we get uh, Joshua and Ann here, and uh, they wanted to share uh, just a little bit of their heart. And you never know, I might throw in a few questions. So let's, uh, let's see how this goes yeah um hi i'm joshua and this is my wife Anne. and uh, just like what cliff said we work for an organization called extreme response uh, our our main headquarters is in uh, georgia uh, but we work in the regional office of asia in manila um and we can sum up what we do in in this way so we help the poor we share the gospel, and we develop leaders to do the same. Um, we're just so thankful to the Lord for this wonderful opportunity to worship with you. And for this opportunity to thank you personally. You know, whenever I think of Sunrise Community Church, um, I think of what Paul said to the Philippian church. And let me read it for you. It says in Philippians 1, three to five, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always offering prayer with joy, in, with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the very first day until now. That's all what I have. That's all we would like to say. Our gratitude and thanksgiving first to God and to all of you. Thank you for sending a team to Manila last Christmas. Sunrise Community Church, just like what Cliff said, um, started sending uh, teams in Manila 
in 2007. That's 17 years. And we're so grateful. Words are not enough to describe, uh, to express our thanksgiving to you all, you know, for the life, for the resources, for the time you have given so that you can minister to the people in the Philippines. I hope and I pray that you will send more teams in the coming Christmases. We would like to thank you also for sending Jason. He's such a great blessing to all of us since he became part of our team and family in 2015. I won't have enough time to share with you all the things that God is doing in and through his life. But this one I could share. One time I asked him, hey, Jason, why come to the Philippines? It's not easy. He immediately said, I don't look for easy. I look for God's will. And that says it all. Because he looks for God's will, we are able to share the gospel Lives are saved and changed by the power of God's word. We are also able to help the poor, whether through education empowerment that Jason is doing or through vocational training that my wife does. And lastly, we are able to develop leaders who are doing the same. But it's not just true about Jason. I could also, just, I could also say the same thing about Sunrise Community Church. Thank you for looking for God's will. Thank you for fully obeying God's will. Thank you for giving glory and honor to our God. Thank you for all your support and prayers. Amen. Thank you so much, Joshua. Now, Ann, I know you are also part of a ministry that's called um, Golden Hands. You want to tell us a little more about that, too? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Golden Hands uh, empower and enrich women in depraved communities. And we give them opportunities to earn, to earn extra income through the livelihood and skills training that we are giving them. In that way, they will end the generational poverty in their families. And can I say also Please, my thanksgiving? Please, absolutely. Okay. I just want to say thank you, Sunrise Community Church, for your support and prayers for what we do in the Philippines. When I first came here, some of your women responded to be Extreme Response Golden Hands prayer warriors and supporters. We cannot do what we are doing without your prayers and support. Thank you for holding the rope with us as we advance the kingdom of God in the lives of women, youth, and children we are serving. Saving souls and transforming lives is still at the very core of our mission. And thank you for being a part of making an impact for the kingdom of God. We may be at the front line and you are in the background, but just like what King David said, the spoils are divided among those who guard and those who fight. And so are we. As we work together for the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will share the same reward for those who fight and for those who guard like you, what, what you are doing. Again, thank you, Sunrise Community Church, for working alongside with us. God bless you and keep you. Right. Amen. Well, we are so grateful that you would be willing to uh, be all the way over here to spend some time with us. Today, right after second service, we're going to have a luncheon over in the youth room, over in the youth center, uh, where you get to know uh, Joshua and Ann a lot more. They're going to share a lot more of what's happening over there. You do not need to have signed up because there were no signups. And uh, so you can just show up. Don't sign up. Show up. And uh, that's right after second service over in the youth building. There is a a lunch and a great time of uh, getting to hear a lot more than we were able to do in this short time here this morning. Um, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward right now. And as we uh, pray for this morning's offering, we also want to pray for Joshua and Ann and the ministry of extreme response. And I just want to remind you, when you uh, support Sunrise, you're not only um, supporting the day-to-day -day operations of this church, but also uh, so many things that we do uh, by empowering 
empowering missionaries overseas, and uh, and these funds go directly also to uh, to that. So uh, let's pray together, and I'm going to pray for you too as well. Um, Father, thank you so much in the name of Jesus for the amazing work uh, that you are doing over in the Philippines, and what a blessing to have Joshua and Anne here this morning. Uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago, standing right here on this stage in this exact same spot where I was uh, interviewing Jason, and he was uh, getting us excited for their arrival. And, um, and so it's a blessing to be where we are here today. I thank you for uh, the ministry of extreme response. I thank you for uh, that mission of theirs to... Um, to go into to the poorest people and bring the gospel and bring help. And so, Father, would you please continue to bless them, empower them, help them to be constantly uh, living under the power of your Holy Spirit, depending upon you uh, as they go. Uh, Father, we uh, commit this uh, offering to you this morning. Uh, would you have your will? Uh, would you do what you want to do, uh, not only here at Sunrise, but all throughout the world? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. You know, I, I think of I, I think of the words of that song and just the, the peace that is there and so much about what we have talked about is is often the world defines peace as an absence of chaos. Yet yet in God's word it teaches us that, that true peace is the presence of God in the chaos. And I think of that as uh, I was just thinking of that song and the picture that kept on coming to me was was Jesus when he's in the boat with his disciples and a storm comes up uh, and and the the waves are are building and and yet Jesus is sleeping in, in the midst of the chaos uh, and everyone else is freaking out and and yet this idea of peace and the presence of God and despite the chaos that's going on hey good morning sunrise Sorry, I should have introduced you, uh, myself. Remember me? I'm, uh, I think I'm the senior pastor here. Uh, it is good to be here. Uh, and we, actually, before I even jump in, I, I got to use my three minutes. Uh, I'll get right back into the old routine. Um, I, two big plugs. One for that lunch afterwards uh, with Joshua and Ian and just hearing more about what's going on in the Philippines, which where, where we sent our team and which so many of you have supported. Please go check that out. The other is if you are new here, uh, if you are wanting to get to know more about Sunrise, if you were wanting to become a member, if you want to meet some of the pastors uh, over the next two weeks we have our life at sunrise class second service upstairs you don't have to sign up we would love for you to join us as cliff and i kind of just lead you through what is going on uh, at sunrise where god is leading us and just the heart of uh, of where he is leading us all right you know I've been away for two weeks and, and Cliff jumped into our series on Acts. And today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. For those of you who are wondering uh, where we were, uh, Sarah and I took a week. And in May, we celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. And so we were, uh, yeah, <laughs> we made it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, so we took some time uh, while the grandparents were down to watch the kids and then after that we were uh, we were in Dallas uh, Texas where uh, we, I had some meetings and then was at a conference at the church where that that develops the program or the curriculum for our our marriage ministry here at sunrise and so it was just a great time away and you know today we're talking about how the spirit was revealed in in chapter 2 and and then how the spirit leads and and we're going to see in a bit about how the Spirit led the disciples in, in that first church. You know, we were, in, we were in Texas and all of a sudden you're there and you realize, yeah, we haven't been there in a long time. And there's all these different things that we want to see. And, and we had a day afterwards and it was like as much as we could pack into one single day. You know, so we went to a Rangers game. Our kids love this uh, group of, of Christian guys who do sports called dude perfect and so we went to their headquarters uh they wouldn't let us in but we still went there uh and then wouldn't you know talk about being led somewhere it just so happens that when we were at dude perfect headquarters which was in frisco texas wouldn't you know that it just so happens that 10 minutes away is the headquarters of the pga of america uh <laughs> total coincidence and uh, it turns out you need a, a card to get into the building. And wouldn't you know, they would not believe that I was Jordan Spieth. So it is, uh, but we wandered around. It was like my own little Disneyland and, and it, was, it was good there. And, and we had a great time, but it's great to be home. And, and there's that point where you're like, I can't wait to be home. I can't wait to be with family, the church family. And, and that's where we find ourselves here. And in fact, there's something about the story today in, in Acts chapter two of all these different groups coming from all different regions of, of around the Roman Empire and they find themselves 
in Jerusalem, they find themselves at Pentecost uh, and the holiday of Shavuot. And so we're going to read about that. We're going to dive into what this means. Uh, Pastor Cliff uh, finished up chapter one, moved a bit into chapter two, and we're going to continue on uh, in this journey as we look at what is next and what life after the resurrection of Jesus looked like in, in first century Israel and in first century uh, Roman Empire as the church was moving and God was moving and the spirit was moving. So join me as we read in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came a, from heaven a sound like a, a mighty rushing wind and, the, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking, speaking, they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and the visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in their own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them, saying, they are filled with the new wine. All right, so, so we've got this interesting, a, a very interesting setting that's happening here. And, and let me just recap what's happening from, from chapter 2, verse 1. It says when, with the setting, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in, in one place. Now, now, as we start to take a look at, at what's, of what's happening here, understand that in their history and what's going on, these first followers were told to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them before they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They had just returned from the Mount of Olives where they, they watched Jesus ascend into heaven. And now they were back in Jerusalem waiting the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Now, Pentecost itself means 50th in Greek. And it refers to a Jewish feast called Shavuot. It's held 50 days after the second day of Passover. It's also called in your Bible the, the Feast of Weeks, as you'll see in Exodus chapter 34, 22, and the Feast of the Harvest, as we see in Exodus chapter 23, 16. Pentecost was one of three Old Testament festivals which people were to travel to Jerusalem and with gifts and with offerings. In this case, the first fruits and the, the harvest that was happening. The feast celebrated the harvest and it was supposed to be filled with great rejoicing. It was held in mid-June in our modern calendar. And it was the largest pilgrimage feast which filled Jerusalem with all sorts of visitors, at least tripling the size of Jerusalem. And at that time, we would see the city grow by about 75,000 people. Now, there's a bit more that's going on here because, and, and I love this because it brings us to the book of Leviticus in, in chapter 23. And there's this direct correlation to Leviticus 23 in the works of Christ. Uh, and, and what's being celebrated with Passover and with Pentecost or with Shavuot and, and what it has in relation with Jesus. And while I won't take a, a long time with this, and I think it's a sermon series for another day as we look at the Feast of Israel, the Passover pictures the sacrificial death of Jesus as the Lamb of God. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, which says, For Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. Jesus died on Passover. The Feast of the First Fruits pictures his resurrection from the dead as seen as 1 Corinthians 15, 20, which says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And then thirdly, Pentecost or Shavuot in Leviticus 23, 
which is celebrated 50 days later, marks the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth and the sending of God's church. There, there's a lot that happens when, when we look at this. And, and since Pentecost is a harvest festival, we can see that as we go through, we'll understand that more and more of the harvest, and you'll see language in Acts being used of the harvest as the church spreads. And the language that's used takes on this agricultural level because this some, is something that resonates with the people of Israel. And when the phrase, when the day of Pentecost arrived, it actually literally means had been completely fulfilled. And I think that's something important to note as, as here's the Holy Spirit arriving. We see Leviticus 23. We see the, the story of the, the festival, the harvest. And here we see the Holy Spirit arrive. And now it says it has been completely fulfilled. Galatians 4, 4 says, but when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son. The idea is not that Pentecost just happened, but rather this particular Pentecost fulfilled its eternal destiny in the great story of God. Notice the believers were all together in one place. Other trans translations might say they were gathered together of one accord. They were there with the same purpose. They were waiting the Holy Spirit. They were hearing what God had told them, what Jesus had told them to do. And now they were gathered together with one accord, with, with one mind. In musical terms, it would mean to strike the same note together. And they had made this commitment to be in community together. And nothing was going to get in their way. Jesus had given them their mission. And it was just going from the Mount of Olives to, to Jerusalem. And that's not a far distance. Yet they, nothing was going to stop them from gathering together and waiting upon what God had promised. This was obvious of value because we see three other times in the first two, two chapters. In chapter 1, 14, verse 14, it says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Later on in verse 44 of chapter 2, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And then just a few verses later, and day by day, they were attending the temple together. Each one of these is talking not only about gathering in person, but gathering with the same mind and spiritually aware of what God was telling them to do. But, but now we see what happens. The Holy Spirit arrives, and, and that's what I want to focus on today is, is the Holy Spirit arrives. And, and as we read through this, it says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and filled the entire house where they were sitting. You see, this, this tells us that, that as the, the Holy Spirit arrived, there were three key things that arrived with that. The first was, was power. The word suddenly means that the sound came abruptly. It was not a gradual noise that just built up, but rather it was abrupt, it was unexpected, and it was immediate. It was not an actual wind, but a sound of a mighty rushing wind. It can be translated as a, if you really went down to the root of it, as a, a violent blasting roar. Sound, uh, sound like a, a tornado or, or a hurricane of that loud boom that you would have and you would experience. But it was in the entire house. Verse 6 tells us that it was so loud that it drew a multitude or drew multitudes to come and see what was happening. Notice also they were sitting, and this, this, is, this is significant because the normal posture for prayer at that time was either to stand or to kneel. They didn't bring the Holy Spirit down by their actions or by their intercessions. They were sitting because they were waiting for the promise of God in their lives, which was the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, he came down unexpectedly, and it was all God's doing. This is the picture that we need to create here. That it's not just, it, it wasn't about what they were doing in this room. They found themselves in the room because they listened to what God had called them to do. The Holy Spirit arriving was the promise of God. They knew that if they went there, that the Holy Spirit would there. They weren't, it, we didn't read nothing that says, you know, well, and, and after five minutes, one of them said, 
hey, Peter, hey, Paul, you want to get on the phone and see when the Holy Spirit's arriving? Like, this is taking a little long. Or, or should we order in some food? It says that they were waiting because they knew it was going to happen. In fact, the language that is used is a language that is used as, as if it is completed. It, it's with certainty they knew this was going to happen. There was no, uh, let's just wait and see what happens. They were waiting knowing that this was a promise of God and therefore it was going to happen. The word wind is, is also a word for spirit, which re represents the power of God. And we first see the spirit uh, at work in creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The spirit's work in the, the new creation is also seen in John chapter 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. You see, the, the story now has gone from, from the Old Testament scriptures to the gospels where it's completed by Jesus and this realization for the disciples now that Jesus is gone and saying, what next? What now? Realizing that everything they've seen has been completed and recognizing the promises of God. They've watched it be, co be completed and now they know this promise is real for them. The, the next is this presence, right? So there's that power that is initially there, the power of the Holy Spirit uh, and, and what you see in the next is the presence. The first sign of the, of the Spirit is this extremely loud and then the second is bright in verse three and, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Notice the flames separated and, and come to rest on each one of them. It's important to note this because nobody is left out. It's, it's not a, oh, it arrived, the, the Holy Spirit arrived first on the most important and then it moved down the hierarchy of who the disciples, uh, who, which of the disciples was most important. The sons of Zebedee were still arguing about who's most important. So it went to them a little later and it, nothing like that happens. It all arrives at the same time. There's that, that, that picture of the presence of God in everybody's life. No one was left out. No one was excluded. Fire in the Bible represents God's purifying presence. In Exodus chapter 3, we see this. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. It's also a picture of the Old Testament of God's leading, not just his presence, but his leading as he led them through the wilderness a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that God may be, his presence may be seen in their midst. These two signs are also found together in Ezekiel chapter one, verse four, where we see God's power and his presence on display. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing, flashing forth continually and in the midst of the fire as if it was a gleaming metal. Where we see the presence of God throughout Old Testament. We see, uh, we see Jesus talk about it as this refining. And now again, it takes one more step to the disciples. It's, it's the sound. It is the presence of God. But more importantly, now it is also the proclamation. The sign of the Holy Spirit is, is verbal and it's found in verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When all 120 believers filled with the Holy Spirit started proclaiming the, the praises of God and who he was in all of their languages, the word tongues refers to intelligible language in this way. These were languages unknown to the speakers, but clearly understood by the hearers. And, and notice this was not a, a prayer language. This was not an, uh, ecstatic utterances, but rather real languages understood by people from other countries. Look at verses five and six. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. 
And the word be, be bewildered means confounded, confused, because they were hearing the praises of God and they, they shouldn't be hearing the, the, the praises of God in the languages that they were hearing. What makes this even more that you don't quite get in the context of this is what's so amazing about this is, is recognizing who this is coming to. Verse seven says, and they were amazed and astonished by saying, are not all of those who are speaking Galileans? They were beside themselves and marveled and wonder at this. Now, <laughs> what you don't catch in here is, is subtle. And I don't know if Luke, while writing it, did this on purpose. What was really striking, why would you put in because they were Galileans? They go out of their way and there's all these people in this room, yet they go out of their way to mention that there's Galileans there. <laughs> well, essentially, Galileans were known as the uneducated and culturally backward folk of the, of the ancient Near East and of Israel of a sort. They were the hillbillies that uh, had a distinct dialect uh, and, and they struggled with guttural sounds of both Aramaic and Hebrew. And so, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched that TV show and I'm not even gonna stay, say what state they're from because I don't wanna get myself in trouble here, but there's a show and it's, it's called Swamp People. Now that narrows it down, I guess. It rhymes with Louisiana. And so... No, and, and so there's this show of people out in the back, the back swamps there, and, and they're speaking English, yet there are subtitles underneath. Because as you're listening to this, you're like, what? And, and apparently someone, they brought in a translator. I don't even know how you learn to translate that, but they brought in a translator and it's saying it in English underneath. This is what the, Gal the picture of the Galileans are here. This is what's kind of funny in verse seven is because this is what is so astonishing in this part why they mentioned the Galileans specific. It's because now these Galileans who have no training or nothing formal whatsoever are speaking in, the, uh, in languages that they have not been trained and they do not know to people from all different areas. They're flabbergasted because these Galileans could speak in multiple language and respond. In verse eight, it says, and how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? To put this into perspective, I've got a map here of where everybody is, where everybody is from on the day of Pentecost. And if you can see it up there, you can see that we've got all these different nations represented that are all together in Jerusalem. Right? So you've got Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, you know, Egypt, all the way down, uh, all the way across to Rome, all around the Roman Empire. And yet, yet what we see here is, is one, people going to Jerusalem who are gathered together. We hear the promise of God and the promise of the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit arrive and we know that there's this proclamation that takes place. This great multitude together in recognizing that they are on one mission. In fact, what is interesting in this is take a look at this, this map up here where everybody is from. And I want you to understand what happens when all of a sudden you're on mission. If you show the next slide, you see the spread you see the spread of, of Christianity uh, from, uh, I would mention a color, but I don't know what the colors are because uh, I'm colorblind, but the darker purple, yeah, lavender. I knew it was lavender. Uh, and uh, the, the lavender color there is around, is where you see, uh, uh, where you see a, a first part of the spread in the early first century. And now there's, Honestly, to me, I don't know if you can see the other two colors there, but where it is, is you see that from every single nation where there were people in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, all of a sudden it spreads across the globe and through the entire Roman Empire. One, because they heard and they understood their mission. 
They understood the power and the presence of God wherever they went. It was not just located in Jerusalem. It was on them. God had given them the Holy Spirit just as Jesus had promised. And now wherever they went, they knew that they were walking with that presence of God with them. Did not matter if you were from Egypt or or Libya or you were from Rome all the way up to modern day Spain or all the way across to Mesopotamia to modern day Iraq and Iran, the word of God immediately spread spread because of the 120 that were there. Within over with, within a century, you saw the growth of, of 25 times the amount that, that had happened in the first 50 years uh, of Christianity. You see this rapid growth all across the Roman Empire. This is phenomenal in understanding the power of the Spirit and being able to understand you need to go where God tells you to go. You need, to, you need to be able, as difficult as it is, to, to focus and work against, because every part of you is saying, you know what? I know where I want to go, and that may not match up where God is leading you or where God is prompting you. It's not just physical location, but he may already have you in the location, but it's who you need to talk to and understanding the presence of God is there. It's, it's against our nature, right? Our natural sinful nature tells us, hey, do what you want. The world tells us, do what you want, do what is good. It's a, it's a relative truth. The word of God is very specific. It's, it's, not, it's not just broad, but God will lead you to a very specific place for such a time as where he has you right now. So Sarah and I were down, we went down and we were, the first week we were in Mexico. We had never been before. And, and we were told, uh, don't, don't go swimming. In fact, there's signs everywhere that we're there. Uh, because if you get sucked out into the water, you'll end up in Hawaii because it's just a very strong riptide. And that's what we were told. And no, I didn't go swimming uh, to see if it was true. But one day, Sarah and I decided to take in the morning a, a romantic walk along the beach. And, and as we walked down the waves and, and you know, you're there and, and you see the waves kind of come up. And, you know, by the end, it's just a little bit of water. And you think, how much could this be? Uh, and so we're walking along. How much rip is in, in this little, you know, three inches of water or anything like that? And so we're walking along and this is great. And, and Sarah's on the ocean side. I'm not on the ocean side. And and, and sure enough, uh, we get to this one part and she's kind of like, okay, I'm just going to get my feet wet. Well, you know, the tide comes up, a big wave comes up and it goes up and it rips the feet right, her feet right out from underneath her. And, and of course I jumped into action, you know, uh, like if there was ever a modern day David, David Hasselhoff, I was that as, as I jumped into action and, uh, someone will get that reference at some point. And, uh, and, and, you know, so it was, she wasn't getting dragged out anywhere. I, I got, we, she got up and, and we continued walking and we we're walking along the beach again and, and about Three or four minutes later, she says to me, hey, just so you know, I noticed. And I'm like, you noticed what? Like my heroics? Uh, well, thank you. You know, it's, uh... she's like, no, I noticed that when I went in the water, I watched for one second where your eye contact went from me to the coffee that you were holding. <laughs> I said, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and, and she was very convinced of this. It's still open for discussion, but the reality is, is, is it, let's just even say that that happened, right? But that's all that it took, right? That's our natural instinct is take something that I really want. And that's, it took a second for me to be like, in theory, like, oh, <laughs> you know, my coffee, Sarah. And of, <laughs> of course, I went for Sarah right away, in theory. And so, 
right? But this is, this is kind of how it is for us, right? And, and I say this because it's just a, a second, right? It only takes a second for us to, to get distracted before we end up focusing on something else. And it only takes Satan a second to distract us from, from something else in our lives, from where he's put us, before all of a sudden we start. And what's one second one day is two seconds the next day, is five seconds the next day, and it just builds, right? And I think what you see here when you look at this is this, is recognizing that, that here you have people in Jerusalem who heard the spirit and they didn't think twice. They, they saw the presence of God. They heard the presence of God. They knew what they were supposed to do and they went. Like without even thinking any further, without debating, they went. And, and I think there's significance here because the Holy Spirit has been universally poured out on all believers. If you are a Christ follower here, then, then you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. God's Spirit settled upon a few select individuals uh, here. But it was clear that this was for everyone who believed in him and it was for everybody. There was not an order in which it went to and it was for everyone. This fulfills what Jesus said in John 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father and the Father will give you another helper with a capital H, you'll notice in your Bibles, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. There's comfort in, in knowing this. God's great plan to spread the glory of the gospel to all nations through, through the church. This is Jesus, what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Meaning that, that when, you, when you get in line with where God is calling you, when you get in line where the spirit is leading you, when you take away the distractions, when you focus on that, you understand that with the power that God has given you, that there is nothing that is gonna stop you. There's nothing that is gonna stop God in this. I love this picture. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here's the thing that we need to understand in the mission going forward. The church is God's plan A. This is God's primary plan. And in fact, I say this because there is no plan B. God's plan for the gospel to spread around the world is using the individuals in, in his church, in the bride of Christ. It, it, there's a reason why that it's, it's phrased that way, the bride of Christ, and it is tethered together. This is God's mission. God's mission and God's church is plan A in his mission. All believers are now empowered to be witnesses for Christ. The meaning of Pentecost was not to encourage believers to have an ecstatic experience and to say, look at what just happened, but rather that they might be empowered to live on mission and tell the story of God's glory in their lives. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to accomplish God's plans. And when the Holy Spirit fills us, Acts chapter 4, 31 gives us our task. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak. There's two responses to all of this, as it is with anything. One, some are receptive. Look at verse 12. And they were all amazed. And then in verse 13, we see that others are resistant. In fact, they said they were mocking. How are you going to respond to the Holy Spirit today? How are you going to respond to where God is leading you today? Because there's only two options in this. Either you are amazed at the power of God and who he is, or you're resistant to where he's leading you. Those are the only options. It's follow Christ or, or not. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I leave us with this. Is is the questions that we want to ask ourselves today are, are how has the Holy Spirit given you power to live on mission? Ask that of, of your own story of where you are, because 
If you are a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit is with you. Second, can you share a story about how God is using you? I love this because now it's taking that tangible, that knowledge of where God has put you and saying, is there a story of how God is using you? And can you share it? And I think the next one, which is so important for us as a community of believers is saying, what has God been teaching you as you reach out? As you, as you hear the spirit of God, as you feel the spirit of God lead you, what is he teaching you? And are you sharing it with others? If you're here today, if you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. If you believe in him. If you're today and you don't know Jesus, my prayer is that today is the day that, that you hear and you feel the power of, of Christ within you as you believe in him, you believe that he died for you, you believe that he rose again for you, that your sins may be forgiven. And, and it's, it's so important. And, and there's a reason why we mention this every Sunday is because we need you to know how important this is to us, whether you're watching online during the week or you're here right now. Christ died for you. The story of this Holy Spirit, the power, the proclamation, the presence of God with you can only happen if you know Jesus and believe in him. So let today be the day that you believe and know that Jesus died for you that you become a Christ follower, that you feel the power of the God who created the heavens and the earth dwell within you with all that same power. Let's pray. God, a story of miracles, of power, of presence, and, and yet the empowering of this proclamation of, of who we are called to be. Uh, and today, Lord, we just think of, Lord, Spirit, guide us on the mission that, we are, that you have put us on as we live out our lives for you. The, the, the purpose of this is not for this, this one-time experience like it was in Jerusalem, but one that shares the story of God's power in our lives and God's transformation in our own lives. Lord, give us the courage, the power, the discernment as we share our story about how you've worked in our lives and Lord, that we don't just keep that to ourselves that as we seek to build our kingdom, no matter where you have sent us, for the people of this time, it was to cross the Roman empire for us. It can be in this very city, in this state, in this nation. But Lord, that we equip each other, sharing the stories of what you've done. And God, if there are people here today who don't know you, we pray that today would be the day that they believe in your power, your promise that you sent your son, your promise of sending the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, that they may believe that they are not alone, both as as a church and a community here, but more importantly, with your presence in their lives. So we pray these things all in your amazing and holy name. Amen.
Amen. And as we see today how the Spirit is revealed and how we can lead a Spirit-led life, if you are here today and you need prayer, if you've got questions about who God is, we would love to pray with you. We have chaplains around the building. We've got a, a prayer team that will be off to the side to pray with you. And as you walk out those doors this morning, understand that we have got our Sunday school fair this, uh, this morning of all the different Sunday schools, plus Grief Share and Reengage and Rooted and different ways that you can connect and be a part of the larger community, meet some of the people, stop by and, and, and say hello with that. And I will finally say, if you are new here or again, you want to meet us as pastors or membership at Sunrise, head right upstairs and come join Pastor Cliff, myself, Sarah will be up there and a few of the other pastors this week as we share where God is leading us as we strive to be a spirit-led church. Take care, have a great week and we'll see you next week, Sunrise.